All right. Okay. Thank you. What would they do without Don and his team? <laughs> As I was saying, I was, uh, I, I, I'm glad to be here, and I'm very, very happy to see some faces I had not seen for quite some time. Thank you for being with us. And uh, Debbie and Rosie, thank you for the special music. And those uh, three girls that were collecting the offering, they look so beautiful. My, oh, my. It is, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It has been a while since I last had uh, the opportunity to uh, bring the message. And uh, it is not that I don't want to. It is just different reasons behind it. Um, but I am very, very happy that I have this opportunity. And I pray that the message uh, will be uh, of uh, edification to everyone. Uh, our hearts also go out to your wife, of course. Um, and uh, I thought I had seen someone else here. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of another Sabbath. Uh, thank you for the rain. Uh, every time we see the rain, we can think of uh, how the gospel uh, is and will continue to be preached uh, throughout the world. Bless us now as we bring the word to your people. In the name of Jesus, amen. As I was praying, I thought of, a, uh, of an app uh, that it is the Sabbath School app. Uh, that has the, um, all the churches uh, in the world. You can see the map and you can just pinpoint churches uh, everywhere. I, I mean everywhere. And I praise God for the Seventh-day Adventist church. Tr truly, it is just in every continent except Antarctica. Uh, but uh, it, it is just amazing and I, as I was talking to someone recently, actually more than one person, uh, for those who are here in the United States and in this town, uh, sometimes we, uh, our, our sight cannot see beyond these walls and this town. But I must tell you, my brothers and sisters, the gospel is spreading like fire in many, many well, right now, Pastor uh, Bachelor is preaching in, uh, in Manhattan, uh, 15 days, uh, is preaching. It doesn't say that 100% of those who are hearing the message will accept the message. Uh, but uh, churches are, uh, are preaching everywhere. Uh, we go, my wife, to Mexico. We have been going there, and you will be amazed uh, and seeing young people preaching. It just, do not be discouraged. Be encouraged. And yes, things are getting into place. Uh, we can see that every, almost every day we see prophecies being fulfilled. By the way, I am tempted to say this, and I'm going to say it. We don't take orders from the king of the north. We don't take orders from the king of the south. We don't owe anything to the king of the north. We don't owe anything to the king of the south. We are right in the middle. We don't owe anything to the left or to the right. We are not partitions. We are not Democrats. We are not Republicans. We are Christians. And in our church, whatever our intention may be to vote, which by the way, the Bible does not forbid that we vote, and the spirit of prophecy does not forbid either that we vote. It is, it is our conscience. We don't preach from the gospel about one party or another. And as members, we are encouraged 
not to uh, prompt others to follow one way or the other. We go to the voting place, and we, if we decide to vote, one way or the other, God's will will be fulfilled. And we are not going to get angry one way or another, because this is not our kingdom. This world is just a passing place. We have another place to go, and that's where our citizen belongs to. I hope I was clear on that. Amen? Um, I had three messages in mind for quite some time, uh, but then the spirit uh, led to uh, Naaman, uh, a beautiful story, right? Uh, actually, uh, Rosie last night said, I love, uh, or something like that, uh, the story of Naaman, and it is indeed a great, great story. Um, we have time. I hope I can take more time than, uh, than uh, Brother Matthew last week, if you know what I mean, for those who were here. But um, I think it would be important uh, to have a little context to Second Kings uh, chapter 5. So we are going to move back a little so we can know where we are coming from. So we are going to, um, we are going to see, we, we know that unfortunately the king, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Uh, Judah and Israel. And the kingdom of uh, Israel was evil because it started with the wrong attitude, with Jeroboam. So one thing led to another. And the kingdom of the north, Israel, had two kingdoms to the east, uh, the Ammonites and the Syrians, also called Aram. The, the kingdom of Israel had constant war against those two pagan kingdoms. And those wars were mostly because of territory. So we'll go to... Um, First Kings, we'll go to First Kings, just to have the context on this. First Kings, and we'll go to chapter 20. First Kings, chapter 20. And we begin with verse 1. Now, Ben-Hadad... The king of Syria, or Aram, where the, the Aramites were, gathered all his forces together. Thirty-two kings were with him. My, oh, my, this must have been quite an army. Thirty-two kings were with him, with horses and chariots, and went up and besieged Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom, and made war against it. Then he sent messengers into the city to Ahab. Hmm, does this name sound familiar? Ahab. How many know this name, Ahab? For those who don't know, have you heard of Jezebel? Yes? So Ahab was the king, and Jezebel was his wife, and was she a nice 
person. Not at all. She was a. Uh, she 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 was really really evil. Okay, she was evil to the most. Uh, she was in uh, in fact the, the the daughter of one of the priests. Um, uh, and she bowed to Baal. So, so, th so this is Ahab. And so this king, Ben-Hadad, is making war against Ahab, who was a, an evil king also. And then uh, we'll read to again. Then, the, then he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad. Listen to this because you are going to see this again. Your silver and your gold are mine. Your loveliest wives and children are mine. This is a real threat to the kingdom of, uh, of the north, to Ahab. Here is coming this Syrian king with more than 30 other kings take siege of Samaria and, uh, and the situation is really, really bad. And he threatens to get everything from him. Verse four. And the king of Israel answered and said, listen to this, my Lord. Who is the Lord? God is the Lord. And, and what is this king doing? He, he, is, he has, no, he has no respect for the, for, for the Lord. My Lord, O oh king. Just as you say, I and all that I have are yours. Isn't that nice? He is giving up right there. He, he, he does not go and look for God. God. God, we are in this predicament. What do we do? No. He, he has no respect for the Lord. He had more respect for Baal. My Lord, O King, just as you say, I and all that I have are yours. Hmm. Could it be that in a way or another, we may say these words to Satan? O King Satan, Everything that I have is yours. <laughs> that is sad to say. But could it be that it is a fact for some of us? Let's continue. And the king, sorry, five. Then the messengers came back and said, Thus speaks Ben-Hadad, saying, Indeed, I have sent to you, saying, you shall deliver to me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children. You will deliver them. We don't have um, all the time, so we are going to skip to verse 31, because this is not the sermon about 31. Then his servant said to him, Look now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Please let us put sackcloth around our waist and ropes around our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. What had happened was that uh, there was a war. And despite he have sins, God helped Ahab despite his disobedience. And now King Ben-Hadad had fled and was asking for mercy from King 
Ahab. Let's see that in verse uh, 19 to 21. Let's go back just a little bit. 19 to 21. Then these young leaders of the provinces went out of the city with the army which followed them, and each one killed his men. So the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the cavalry. Cal cavalry. Okay, so that, that is the context. So we'll go again, still in chapter 20, but then this time we'll go to the end of the chapter. We'll go to verse 40 and read all the way through 43. While your servant's servant was busy here and there, he was gone. Then the king of Israel, who is this? Ahab, said to him, So shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it. And he hastened to take the bandage away from his eyes. And the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. Then he said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have let slipped out of your hand a man, who is this man? The king Ben-Hadad. Because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. So the king of Israel went to his house, sullen and displeased, and came to Samaria. So what happened? You have to read the whole chapter. We, don't, we are not going to do that. Instead of taking the word of the prophet and, and Ahab to kill Ben-Hadad, king of the Syrians, King Ahab made a treaty of peace with him, with the enemy, whom God has said, don't spare his life. In fact, that would mean take the whole family out. But no, King Ahab did not obey the God of heaven, but he let him live. A few years later, we are not going to go there, Ahab was killed in one of the battles in which was led by King Ben-Hadad. Sad. He, had, he, he should have taken care of that. Let's see one more verse. Just in case. 2023. Because I think this is, this is a good message for us today. During the battle, during the back and forth, the Israelites had won a battle. Verse uh, 23. Then the servants of the king of Syria said to him, their gods, talking about the Israelites, their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But if we fight against them in the plain, surely we will be stronger than they. That's what the Syrians said. Their gods are the gods of the mountains. That's why they defeated us. But if we go to the valley, we are going to defeat them. Let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters. Our God is both the king of the mountains, the king of the valleys, and the king of the universe. 
He has no other place but in our hearts and in heaven. When we are high in the mountains with our families, with our resources, with our jobs, whatever that may be, when we are up in the mountains, God is there. And when we are in the valleys, maybe with depression, maybe we lost our jobs, maybe we had a health condition that it is terminal, uh, maybe it is uh, something that relates to the church, God is there. Now, let's go to Second Kings, which is the purpose of uh, today's message. Second Kings 5. Now, Naaman, as I was uh, preparing the message, and I did not know, I learned the meaning of Naaman. Anyone knows? Pleasant. <laughs> pleasant. Now, what, what pleasant could it be about Naaman? He was a military man who went to battle and he raided villages and cities and and later on, we will see that he had a temper, pleasant. Now, I, I thought for a moment, what, what if there is someone whose name is Christian, but he's a thief or a murderer or whatever else um, evil may be? He is Christian by name only. But other than that, he is not Christian at all. Now, in the same manner, we may call ourselves Christians, but deny the profession of our faith in the way we speak, in the way we act, in the way we relate to others, whether it is at home, in school, in the neighborhood, at work, and be Christians only by name. And we may even seem pleasant to others, but in fact, we may not be. But let's continue. Uh, so now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. C can you guess what king of Syria this may be? <laughs> it is exactly the same man God had said, don't have mercy on him, but get him out of this world and his family. And here he is back again, and he is commanding Naaman to go and raid the villages and plunder the, the riches of, of the Israelites. When we disobey God, bad things are going to happen. We better obey him so we don't have to suffer the consequences of our actions. So this is the king. So now we continue and say, he, Naaman, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. What does that mean? It meant that he did his job as a commander, as a captain, as a general, whatever he was. He did what he had to do. He obeyed his king. He was respected among his troops because he did what he needed to do to keep his job. I think we should have those words for ourselves, be honorable. Now, something that is striking is coming in the next sentence. Because by him, 
the Lord had given victory to Syria. That is just really, really strange. The Lord gave victory to Syria through the hand of Naaman. So why would God, the God of Israel, the God of Judah, give victory to Syria? And even this bad king, we would have to go back to, um, to Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy to understand that sentence. We are not going to read the whole chapter, but we will read several verses. Possibly this is a known chapter to some, and this may have some applications to even us. So we'll start in verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 28, thank you, verse 15, Deuteronomy 28, 15, but, this is the word talking, but it shall come to pass, and then the word that comes is if, which is a choice, right? If you do not, what? Obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So th these curses will come if what? you disobey. So it does not depend on the Lord, it depends on the decision of the Israelites. Verse 20. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doing in which you have forsaken me. That is absolutely clear. Verse 25. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. Verse 32. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long, and there shall be no strength in your hand. Verse 41. You shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours for they shall go into captivity. And verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. So why did God give victory to the Syrians? That is clear. The Israelites had disobeyed God again and again and again. And what it is very sad is that the innocent, even children, had to pay the consequences of the decision of their parents by bowing to false gods. But that was part of these curses. Yes, the Israelites were suffering the consequences of their own decisions because they had forsaken God. They did evil, 
they worship God, Baal and other foreign gods. Now, as we continue in 2 Kings chapter 5, we find in, uh, in verse 1, he, Naaman, was also a mighty man of valor, valor but a leper. He was a man of valor. Are we men and women of valor? We should. Bold, strong for the Lord. But he was a leper. You know, he had a role. He was the commander of the troops. He had his wife, family, possibly children. He had riches. He had the respect of the troops. He had everything, but he was a leper. You know, sometimes we don't have to have it all. And sometimes we don't. Uh, I, don't lose here, but let's go just for a moment to Proverbs chapter 30. There is a, a known verse too. Chapter 30, Proverbs 30, and verse 7 to 9. Proverbs 30, 7 to 9. Two things I request of you, deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Do we have food? Amen. Do we have a place that we can put our head? Amen. Do we have health? Amen. You know, sometimes we are too greedy with some things. I'm not saying that we should not have possessions. God, God, as we are blessed, you know, God blesses and we continue to bless others. And that is good. Uh, but having health is it's a big, big plus, don't you think? But he was a leper. Then in verse 2, we read, And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. What, what can we say? Um... As I said before, this girl was an innocent girl. We don't know the age. And she was just suffering the consequences of the decision of the kings in Israel and those who continue to worship Baal. Now, how would she respond? How would she react to this condition? Maybe her parents had been killed. Maybe their home had been burned. We don't know. How would, how would we act in the face of adversity when we are innocent, when we don't have anything to do with the suffering that we are going through, but others? You know, this girl could have been thinking about vengeance. I'm going to wait that he is asleep, and then I'm going to do something. She may have been having a bitter heart, uh, hating everybody, hating the world, hating the church, in our case. Uh, 
But this girl decided to have a positive and forgiving heart. Otherwise, he, she would not have said what she said. She could have said, this is not my problem, right? I don't care if he is a leper. But um, she saw a need and she decided to do something. Let me say that one more time. She saw a need and despite the circumstances, she decided to do something. And let me say that one more time. She saw a need and she decided to do something about it. Is that clear? Let's continue with uh, the story. Verse 3. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Oh, interesting. You know, this word, if, as we said before, uh, is, is, is a matter of decision. It gives an option. If only, she said. So, so th this girl is using uh, tact in the way she is speaking. And this word if is opening the door of faith. This word if is opening the word of faith. Keep that in mind. You know, it is possible that Naaman had heard about Elijah and Elisha and the miracles that they had performed. Yes, he was a pagan, but uh, even the pagans knew about God. Or God with a G lowercase, but they did not know better. But they had heard about these miracles. So this word if had opened the door and he decided to do something after he heard it from his wife. Verse 4. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, thus, thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. So he was at his home, and he heard the, the message from this girl on the mouth of his wife. And he could just stay there and do nothing about it. And the faith would have died there. But he decided to go one step further in his faith, and he went to his master and told him, thus and thus said the girl. Now, let's see what happens in the next verse. Verse 5. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Verse continue. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. 
verse 6, then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which, which said, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. So he is going from his house to the palace of, of King Ben-Hadad, and then the king says, go. And what does he do? He goes. And that is another step of faith. He could have just stopped there and say, you know what? No, I better not go. I have raided their homes. I have plundered their possessions. I have burned their houses. I have, I have killed many, many soldiers. But that did not stop him from going. Why? Because his need was great. And when our need is great, we can go places. Our faith can take you beyond what we thought that we could accomplish by the strength of God. How does that happen? Because of the need. If there is no need, why do we? Right? Now, as we said before, um, he went and he presented this letter to the king of Israel. Who was this king of Israel? Let, let, don't, don't lose there, but let's go back just a little bit, a little bit to 2 Kings chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1. Now, Jerome, the what? The son of Ahab. Now he had taken over the kingdom. And what does continue to say? At Samaria, in the 18th year of Je Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years, and he did what? Evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother, for he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, verse 3, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. So this son of Ahab, he had the chance to, to change. But he decided just continue on the sins of the kings of Israel. You know what? Since he was the son of Ahab, he may have um, seen when fire can, came down from heaven and burned out the sacrifice in Mount Carmel. He might have been there. He had seen the power of God. He may have heard of the miracles that Elijah had performed. He had heard of the miracles that, ha that God had performed in Egypt and in the desert and how God had taken these people out from Egypt and how God had delivered David from Saul. He may have known all the stories, but that was it. He knew 
that he did not obey. And how many of us can be in the same position? We know the stories. We know the Saba. We know all the doctrines. We know, but not change. Just knowing is not going to save us. He may have said, you know, my father was an idol worshiper, and I am an idol worshiper. What can I do? My father was a smoker. What can I do? I am a smoker. My father was an alcoholic. What can I do? I am an alcoholic too. That is not the power of God. We are not to be our parents. You know, whatever they did. <laughs> Let's continue. Um, we'll jump to, no, yeah, verse 7. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his cloth and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. You know, Naaman was in the palace uh, in Syria, and his faith took him to the palace in Israel, in Samaria. And I am confident that he thought that when he returned from this palace, he was going to be healed. I'm done. But no. The step of faith took him there, but that was not the end. Are you with me? He still had to go on. And that might have been a disappointment for him. And aren't we sometimes disappointed when we pray and there is no answer at that time? Verse 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you turned your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Praise the Lord. Send him to me. Send him to my house, and I will let him know that there is a prophet in Israel, there is a God in Israel. And so what does he do? Um, Naaman, verse 9, then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. All right, so he goes from one place to another, to another, and now he is in front of the door of Elijah. And this is it. Here he is. But then, what happens? Verse 10. And Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, go again and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be, that will be, will be restored to you and you shall be clean. Now, let's stop for a moment and ask, why, why did Elijah didn't, I'm not saying it's right, uh, he, he, Elijah did not allow Naaman to see him. 
what does Hebrew 11 1 says? What is faith? Do we have to see to believe? Uh uh uh. This was a test of faith that he would believe even if he would not see Elijah himself. We don't have to see God to believe. And that was a test to Naaman. He did not know. He was, he was learning the ways of faith. Even when the messenger had said, and you will be clean. Not, not, not maybe, but you will. That was the word of the prophet. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Seven times. Every, every one of those seven Every moment of plunging into the water was a test of faith. Beginning with the first plunge. Maybe he would have quit at the first one. Say, this is dumb. <laughs> this is nonsense. This is ridiculous. What God is asking of me, it just makes absolutely no sense. Are you with me? What God is asking, me, asking of me is just makes no sense at all. <laughs> now, th there is something here that we have to pay attention how did he react? Verse 11. But Naaman became, the word here is furious, and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. He was what? Furious. Was he furious against Elijah, or was he furious against the Lord? <laughs> or both. That's right. He could not understand what faith was. And he was what? Angry. You know, I, I remember we went once to visit a, a lady who was sick years ago. And as we visit this lady who had suffered a stroke, there was a visitor. She had been an Adventist. And as we started talking, uh, I, I noticed that she was uh, angry. It, it, was, it, it was there. She had prayed, I think was a, a family member. I, I, want, I don't want to say mother, of, I, I don't remember, this years ago. And, and the... And the the family member died, and, and she had prayed that, that this family member would be healed. She decided not to come back to church, and I could see how angry she was still with God. I, I, and I, I will never forget that experience, and I wonder, 
how many people are maybe in the same boat. Angry with God because of this happened or that happened in their lives. Faith is a journey. And sometimes in our journey, we may get frustrated. We may get angry. We may get really, really upset. Because we cannot understand what God is asking from us. The other part that I want to emphasize here is Naaman's expectations. I said to myself, he is going to come out and do this and do that and, and then I will be healed. And sometimes we have expectations that are not the right expectations. Maybe even when we come to church, oh, I'm going to be baptized. And the members will just bow before me <laughs> because I am so, so, so good and so intelligent. And I will be given the position of elder right away. Right? And I will be this and I will be that. And, and have the wrong expectations. Faith is not... a fast food restaurant. Faith is not like 5G internet. Right? We all are working on the process of believing. And at times it's not easy, especially we are humans, and we have different personalities, and it is hard sometimes to bear with one another, right? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, verse 12, are not the Abana and the far, far, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of all. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. My way or no way. That will be the wrong attitudes for us Christians. Is not the Mormon church building better than our building? It is not the crystal church better than our, it is not this, it is not the service in the Shiloh church better than our service here in Pocono Grace. It is not, it is not better this or that. Are you with me? This is, this is our Jordan. This is our Jordan, with all the mud. <laughs> but it is our Jordan. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. This is where we plunge each other, you know, all of us together. <laughs> this is our Jordan. Verse 13, and his servants came near and spoke to him and said, my father, oh my, that is so cute, my father, if the prophet had, had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, just wash and be clean? God is not complicated. You see here? God is not complicated. We make things complicated. <laughs> Just go and wash. 
in our journey to faith, sometimes we need someone on our side, a mediator, someone who would come and say, mother, father, mother, why are you up so upset? Why are you so angry with sister so-and-so? Just go and fix the situation. It is not a big deal. There are more important things to do. Just go and watch in the Jordan. It is muddy, but it is okay. Sometimes we need a mediator. And sometimes we ourselves can be the mediators for others. Verse 14. So, he went. All right. Here we go. So, he was in his house. He went to the palace in Syria. And then he went to the palace in Israel. And then he went to the house of Elijah. Now he went to the river, but he had not plunged yet there, right? But now in verse 14, so he went down and dipped seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Amen. Not once, not twice, but seven times. And faith continue growing every time he dipped into the mud. And so it is our faith. We have to go down again and again and again to be clean. And when our faith has grown, we will be clean. In fact, God has already cleansed us with his blood, the blood on the cross, isn't it? Was he grateful? Verse 15, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Two things. Now I know there is a God in Israel. What powerful words are those. When we have come to faith and God has delivered us, we can say like Naaman, I know there is a God in heaven. I have no doubt. I know I have failed in the past. I know I was worshiping false gods, gods of stone and wood, but now I see that there is a God of heaven who created everything. That's point number one. Then point number two, it says, please take a gift, gift from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Elijah did not receive a penny from Naaman. Why? Two things. This was not something that Naaman had earned. That was the product of the raids that Ben-Hadad had ordered. It was money of blood. Yes? Who, 
that, that, that money was cursed. Secondly, the gift of God is free. We don't have to pay God for anything. God has already paid with his blood. He is the owner of everything. Why would he give him anything? If we give, it's because we are grateful. But this was not reason. It was, it was the gift of salvation. You know, it is interesting that Jesus referred to Naaman. And he said, during the time of the kings, no one was healed in Israel except those who were outside. Naaman included. You know, if we read a few chapters after, we will see that there were four lepers. None of them were healed. Why? Because Jesus said, because they were incredulous. Naaman, despite his arrogance and pride, because he was arrogant and proud, he was healed. And we will see him. Now, let me finish with this, because it is past the time. Um, just give me a moment. Um, forgive me. Yeah, here it is. Verse 18. Naaman talking to Elijah. Yet, in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master, the king, goes into the temple of Rimon, a false god, the god of thunder, to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimon. This is, Na this is Naaman talking. And I bow in the temple of Rimon. When I bow in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. And then Elijah answered. Then he said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. Naaman said, I ask for this, that when I have to go with my king to the temple of Rimon, and I bow in that temple, that God will forgive me. And Elijah said what? Go in peace. Let me tell you what it means to me. If this Elijah was a Pharisee, he would say, no, absolutely no. You cannot go in that temple again. Now you have believed, now you have been cleansed. No, 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 no. Absolutely, you cannot go in there. Are you with me? Yes or no? Naaman was in a journey of faith. And his time was going to come one way or another. We cannot let fanaticism stop someone from growing in faith. Many have left because we were too fanatic in our way to treat those who were so tender in the faith. Shame on us. We should, like Elijah said, go in peace, grow in faith.
Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your patience with us, for your, for your mercy, your compassion, your, your grace, abundant and free. Oh, Father, we ask that you will forgive us for those times when we have failed you and we have bowed down to the enemy and not obey your commandments. Forgive us if we have, uh, by our action or inaction, um, had consequences, bad consequences for others. Help us every day to grow in faith and that we may be understanding of others. In the name of Jesus, amen.